is the 14th message on prophecy, and we're dealing tonight with the subject of Sodom. Necessary to take a few minutes of review, as we often do when we're in a series of messages, and to remind you of the subject we dealt with this afternoon. In the book of Luke, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ draws a prophetic parallel and he states that the last days or the end times, the generation that sees his coming to bring a just judgment and retribution upon earth, will be likened unto the generation of Lot. Lot was an Old Testament character who lived in the city of Sodom. The city of Sodom was one of the five cities of the plains or the plains of Jordan, a vast fertile valley land which surrounded the Jordan River area, and in this city Lot abode with his wife and his two daughters and his sons-in-law. Sodom, however, was a very, very wicked city, and God announced to Abraham, who was Lot's uncle, that the time had come for him to deal in judgment and in punishment for sin with Sodom and Gomorrah, its twin city. So announcing this coming judgment to Abraham, God went down to Sodom to visit personally the city and see if the iniquity of the city was as it had been reported to him. When the Lord visited Sodom, he saw that the wickedness of men was exceedingly great and increasing every day. So he brought a fearful and horrible judgment upon the cities of the plains. The Bible describes it as sudden fire and brimstone raining down out of heaven upon these cities, and they were utterly and completely consumed and destroyed in the wrath of God's judgment. Now Jesus Christ, when teaching about the last days, we refer to the last days as those days just previous to the coming of Christ in person on earth, he likened these last days to the days of Sodom, to the days of Lot. We've been searching the word this afternoon and tonight to see the parallel between Lot's time and ours. What do we have in common with Sodom? To review a few minutes, the things we said this afternoon, we took a tour in the word of God of Sodom. We visited it, first of all, as man sees it, and we found our first reference in the 13th chapter of Genesis, when Abraham and Lot stood on a lofty mountain top and looked down over this entire valley, and Lot saw the fertile fields of Jordan, saw the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he said, I'll go this direction, and Abraham chose to go the opposite direction. And he saw that this whole valley was fertile, it was lush, and the Holy Spirit likens the valley of Jordan to the paradise of God or the Garden of Eden before sin disrupted the fellowship between Adam and God. It is also likened to the valley of the Nile in Egypt. We learn from the words of the Lord Jesus in Luke 17 that it was a city or cities which was given over entirely to big business, for they were buying and selling, they were planting, they were building, they were eating, drinking. And in Ezekiel's prophecy we saw that three marks of Sodom's civilization was spiritual pride, a fullness of bread or an abundance of material things, and an abundance of idleness. We saw in these prophetic scriptures the picture of Sodom's civilization, a civilization where peace, plenty, and prosperity were its hallmarks, abundance of idleness among its people, fullness of bread or an abundance of material things. We saw that Sodom was marked by an age of gluttony and drunkenness. Construction and agriculture and business consumed their time and interests. And worst of all, it was a civilization which had decayed completely morally and spiritually. For we learned that Peter in his second epistle described Sodom 
as being filthy, ungodly, unlawful, wicked, under the condemnation of God and deserving the just judgment of God. He described Sodom as being a place where the righteous were vexed or tormented daily by the awful outlandish wickedness of the inhabitants of Sodom. And we saw that as God looked upon Sodom, he said that it was wicked to the core. Best I can describe it, it was a sewer of sin, a cesspool of iniquity. It was the melting pot of all ungodliness and unlawfulness of sort of lot time God overthrew it in one day with a fearful catastrophic judgment which came directly from heaven was described as fire and brimstone raining down upon the city we learn in Genesis 19 just how filthy Sodom really was so filthy that the entire city was given over to the sin of sodomy and roving gangs of the people of the city even did violence in breaking down the doors of private homes to corrupt and ravish the inhabitants of the city. Such a horrible cesspool of sin was Sodom that God sent two angelic messengers, or two heavenly messengers, I should say, to Sodom to deliver Lot, who was the only righteous man in the city along with his wife and two daughters, but his wife looked back, turned to a pillar of salt, and was destroyed along with the five cities of the plains. This is the background of our message tonight. But what I'm interested in this evening is one thing. What triggered the destruction of Sodom? True, they were wicked, but other generations had been wicked too. True, they were forgetful of God, but other generations had been forgetful too. And it is true that they were unconcerned, but other generations were unconcerned with spiritual things too. And it's true that they had in their peace, plenty, and prosperity turned to complete moral debauchery, but other generations had too. What then triggered this awful catastrophe which overtook them? And I think we shall find the answer in Genesis 18. Verses 20 to 21. Dave, that sun's bothering you just to blind. Anybody bother with the light, just get up and turn them up or down. In Genesis 18, verses 20 to 21, you will see the cause of the overthrow of Sodom. Verse 20 reads, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. There's some interesting things in these two verses of Scripture. First of all, somebody cried unto the Lord about the grievous sin of Sodom. I don't believe it was Abraham, because Abraham didn't live in Sodom. In fact, he was far removed from Sodom and probably knew very little about spiritual conditions in Sodom, because Abraham was stirred to intercessory prayer for Lot only after God announced to him the destruction of Sodom, which was pending. I don't believe it was Abraham, and yet who could have cried unto God about the wickedness of the city of Sodom? In the book of James in the New Testament, we read that the prayer or the fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we learn in the New Testament that Lot was described as that righteous Lot. And I believe that that righteous man, for we learn in Genesis 18 that there were not ten righteous men in the city of Sodom, for God promised to spare the city if Abraham could show him ten righteous men. And there were not ten righteous men in the city, just one righteous man, Lot himself. And I believe that that one righteous man prayed fervently and effectually unto God about the wickedness of the city in which he lived. 
For here in these two verses in Genesis 18, we have God saying that the cry of their grievous sin had come unto him. Now, I don't think the Sodomites were crying to God about their sins. It was some righteous man who cried out at the sight and sound of the sin of Sodom. In 2 Peter 2, when this is touched on, Peter says that Lot's soul was vexed or tormented day by day because he saw and heard the filthy deeds of the ungodly. And we have this picture. We have a saved man living, as it were, in the slime pit of hell. A saved man living in one of the most wicked cities that ever existed. A saved man who was so tormented in his soul that the Hebrew says he shrieked or cried out to God over the wickedness of the city. And God heard him. For he said to Abraham, the cry or the shriek of the sin of Sodom is coming to me, and I'm personally going down to investigate it. And if it's as bad as that which has been reported to me, I'm going to utterly destroy it from the face of the earth. Now notice very carefully, in verse 20, the Lord said, because the cry, or the shriek or outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because, here's the second reason, their sin is very grievous. And the word grievous means heavy, it means burdensome, it means a great crushing weight. Now, with some considerations here, first of all, who was crying out under the heavy, burdensome, crushing weight of the sin of Sodom? I do not believe the Sodomites were, for they were unconcerned and indifferent. I don't believe that the sin of Sodom was a crushing weight to God. I don't believe it was a burdensome stone to him, for he was not responsible for their sin. But there was someone upon whose heart the sin of Sodom became a burdensome weight. It became so grievous that he could not bear it. And he shrieked out, he cried out to God incessantly until God heard him about the sin of Sodom. I believe with all my heart that man who prayed that judgment on that city was Lot himself. I have a little different view of Lot tonight than I have ever had before. Lot was a man caught in the middle. He was in the press of circumstances. Wasn't there anything wrong with him living in the city? Are we to be like the monks and withdraw the testimony of the Lord from every wicked place on earth? Must not God have his witnesses in every cesspool of iniquity? There was nothing wrong with Lot living in Sodom. We are in the world, yet not of the world. Lot was in the world, and next week when we examine Lot and his testimony, we will find more sympathy in our hearts for him than perhaps we have tonight. Which one of us could have worn his shoes and maintained any kind of fellowship or communion with God in the midst of such lawlessness? Which one of us would take his task of raising two daughters in a city given over to the worst kind of sex orgies night after night after night? Which one of us could have borne the testimony in Sodom that Lot bore with the heavy burden of an unsaved wife, two mocking son-in-laws, and a whole city that violently clamored at his door to spoil everything and everyone who came beneath his roof? Yet Lot had a way out. You'll hear more about this next week. This is one of the ways he had out. He had the way of prayer. Oh, how I thank God that down in that deep cistern of sin there was a voice that cried out in the night against the unjustness, 
the ungodliness, the grievous, burdensome, the heavy weight of sin that was about him daily. This was Lot groaning in intercession? No. Groaning for judgment, crying out to God that the cup of their iniquity was full. And I believe I know the very words of Lot. How long, how long, O Lord, must thy people suffer? And there came a time when God himself rose up and said, I will personally visit that place because the cry of their sin has come against me. And if it is as reported, I will utterly destroy them from the face of the earth. Not only was Lot tormented day and night for the wickedness of his time, but I believe according to this 20th verse, the sin was very heavy. I believe it become an unbearable weight upon him. And under the pressure of those times, he resorted to the only outlet that he had, and that was to pray and pray that God would soon visit his people in judgment. And I believe that all over the world tonight, perhaps not in your life, perhaps not in mine, but there are those who are feeling the unbearable weight of the atmosphere of the Sodom in which we live, who are no longer crying out in their session. They're crying out now for judgment. And if you'll remember in the book of Revelation that during the tribulation time the souls under the altar that were martyred for the testimony of Jesus, were crying out, How long, O Lord, how long, before you avenge our blood on earth? And I believe the saints of God in various places tonight, as I said, perhaps not you, for perhaps the pressure of these last days has not reached you as it has reached others, but there are those who are crying under the unbearable pressure of Sodom's day, and asking God for a swift judgment. Let this be your hope. God heard Lot. In the middle of all the confusion of Sodom, God heard him. He was one voice, one insignificant man in a city, but his prayer reached heaven, and God said this cry had come unto him, and he had heard it, and he moved out of heaven to do something about it. You say, what kind of pressure was Lot under? Well, I'm going to show you a little bit of the pressure he was under. Genesis 19, we have the story of these two heavenly messengers who came to Sodom to tell Lot about the judgment that was about to fall and to deliver him from the city. I'm not going to be dogmatic in who I think these two visitors Lot had were, but I am satisfied in my own heart that they were the Lord Jesus Christ, or uh, I, I believe that they were God, and I believe that they were the Holy Spirit. And the reasons I say that is because it was at Calvary that the Lord Jesus Christ came into possession of all judgment. It was there at the cross that God turned over the matter of judgment to him. But in the Old Testament, we read that judgment was the strange work of Jehovah and not the sons. The son's ministry was saving, but God's ministry was judgment. And when the son became the Savior and bore upon himself the judgment of the world, then all judgment was given over to the hand of the Lord Jesus. But I believe in the Old Testament that judgment was the strange work of Jehovah. And I believe that these two persons from heaven who visited Lot were God himself and the Holy Spirit. And you will see later on in this incident why I think that second person was the Holy Spirit. One of those persons laid hold of the hand of Lot's wife and led her to a place of safety only to have her turn her back on the leading of this blessed person from heaven and go back to her sin and to ultimate destruction. I believe Lot's wife was led of the Holy Spirit in conviction to flee the wrath to come, only to turn back and to perish 
in the judgment that fell. But here was God himself and the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that when God visited Abraham, there were three men, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for they came to commune with Abraham. This was a time of communion, time of fellowship. They feasted with him. But when God went down to visit Sodom in judgment, only two went to Sodom. God and the Holy Spirit, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, came to Sodom to visit Lot, to inform him of the judgment to come, to lead him safely from the city. And they were in the disguise of men. They appeared as two men in Lot's house. They were taken in by Lot, for their identities were yet unknown to him. They were fed and given hospitable treatment. Beds were prepared for them, and after they had talked and feasted and made ready to go to bed, there came a terrible turmoil and clamor in the street below. And it was the wicked men of the city, the Sodomites, wicked, morally perverted, sexually perverted men who wanted to tear down the door of Lot's house and get to these two strange men who were visiting beneath his roof. Now I want to show you some of the conduct of these men of Sodom and some of the pressures under which Lot was forced to live in this city day after day. First of all, if you'll notice in Genesis 19.5, and this is interesting, maybe it isn't significant in your life, it surely is in mine, this was one of the pressures that was put on Lot's life in Sodom. The inhabitants of the city, the unsaved neighbors of the city of Sodom knew every bit of Lot's private and personal affairs, and they watched his house day and night to see who went in and who went out. It's interesting, isn't it? These two men came along and slipped into Lot's house to spend the night. But before they could go to bed, the whole city knew that two strange men had come to Lot's house. And before they had come to bed, two strange men were identified by the whole city as Lot's visitors, and a whole mob had descended upon his house to disrupt his fellowship in heavenly things. The whole city of Sodom was bent on disrupting Lot's fellowship in the things of the Lord. They constantly watched him, knew all of his private affairs, and broadcast them over the city that they might become a source of irritation to him. For before these men could even go to bed, they were pounding on the door of the house saying, we know two visitors came to your house. We know what's going on in there. Send them out that we may know them. And I admire very much the patience of Lot. He might have called the police. He could have grabbed his double-barrel shotgun and went to the front door. He could have refused to answer them, but he didn't. I like Lot. He went out on the porch and he shut the door behind him. He called them brethren. Don't misconstrue that. He didn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that they were brothers in the Lord. Neither did he mean they were his brothers in the flesh. He called them brethren as he would have called them neighbors. And he went out and said neighbors or fellow sodomites, fellow inhabitants of the city, do not, please, do not do so wickedly. These men are my guests. They have come to my home. Give us at least a few hours of heavenly fellowship between us, will you not? And then they begin to call him names. And in this conversation that follows, you will see what the inhabitants of Sodom thought of Lot. First of all, they called him a sojourner. 
They looked upon him as an intruder. They looked upon him as a foreigner. They looked upon him as somebody who didn't belong in Sodom. They looked upon him as somebody who came in there meddling with their affairs. They looked upon him as someone who disrupted their way of life. And furthermore, they mockingly called him a judge, which was just an old-fashioned way of calling him a holier-than-thou, and saying, Who do you think you are, you intruder, you foreigner? You come in here and set yourself up as a judge? You tell us what's wrong and what's right? Well, we'll tell you something. And furthermore, they hated the ground that Lot walked on, and they gladly would have slain him had it not been for divine interference there in that conversation. And let me tell you something else. If the Holy Spirit calls Lot a righteous man and a just man, I maintain that he had the same righteousness that Noah had, and it was the righteousness of God in Christ by faith. And I assume that that righteousness was outwardly manifested in some way. For let me tell you, Lot was far from being a popular man in the city of Sodom. He was a despised, hated, rejected, and persecuted man in the city of Sodom. His neighbors watched him like a hawk and made a log of his daily events. They knew the goings and the comings of his visitors. And they broadcasted on the grapevine of gossip across the city of Sodom until even the private hours of fellowship that he might have enjoyed with the saints was disrupted by the clamoring of evil men at his door. And had he had a telephone, they would have rung it off the hook all evening. Do you believe it? Well, now it's what the Bible says. <laughs> Do you understand now why I came to the conclusion that Lot must have been the man that was crying out to God under the unbearable burden and pressure of Sodom's sin? Listen, next week, I keep saying that because I want you to come back, see, when we talk about how God graciously took care of Lot in Sodom, oh, I found some wonderful things about the marvelous provision of grace in Lot's life. And you'll thrill to it because we are the Lots of today. And you'll marvel at the grace that kept him and preserved him. Do you realize that a whole valley was corrupt, but God kept this man clean and separate unto himself in the midst of this corruption? <coughs> But here, God gave him patience, and God gave him grace, and God gave him whatever he needed to bear up under this unbearable persecution. But in the night season, someone in that city was crying to God under the heavy, crushing load of the influence of Sodom upon him. And the writer of Peter's second epistle, Peter himself, admits openly that it was Lot who was tormented in his righteous soul, and apparently that one cried unto God for judgment upon his people. Not only did these people hate him, despise him, accuse him of setting himself up as a judge, consider him an intruder in their affairs, not only did they watch his private affairs, disrupt his fellowship with others who loved the Lord, but they would have in violence torn the door from the hinges of his house and would have taken his life had they found a way to do it. This was the wicked sin and how it affected Lot. One of the saddest pressures under which Lot worked is found in the 14th verse, when aroused by the word of God about the pending judgment, so burdened in the night for the souls of his family, so concerned for his sons-in-law, that he arose in the night and went to where they slept and awakened them and pled with them 
to flee with him from the wrath that was about to come and to escape with him the coming judgment. They considered his tearful pleadings as a practical joke. For the word mocked in the Hebrew means that these sons-in-law considered Lot an old fool, a jokester, who got them up in the middle of the night to pull some practical joke on them. They had utterly disrespect entirely for their father-in-law. I don't think this is Lot's fault. I think it is a part of the sin and the iniquity that abounded in, in Sodom. But doesn't your heart ache for this man, burdened for his sons-in-laws, openly pleading with them to be saved, openly entreating them to turn to the Lord for salvation while there was time, only to have them stand to his face and mock him, make fun of him, accusing him of telling jokes. And he turns away from their door with saddened heart, knowing that not even in his own family circle can he make the voice of the Lord heard in such a cesspool of iniquity. This is love. And then I think that probably one of the most significant things in their attitude toward him is this. When he rebuked them for their sin in a mild way and told them that they had purposed to do wickedly and pled with them to cease in their sin, at least on his threshold. For back in the New Testament it says that daily he had to see and hear their iniquity. He couldn't escape it. It was everywhere. There was no privacy. There was no getting away from their ungodly deeds and acts and words. Wherever he went, he was subject to it. Wherever he went, he breathed the very air, smelled the very odor of it, heard the very sounds of it. He was literally baptized in their sin and in their iniquity, and it vexed or tormented his righteous soul day by day. They would have committed their vileness on Lot's very doorstep, yea, in the very sanctity of his home, had he not gone to the door to prevent it. And when he rebuked them for their wickedness and pled with them to at least take their wickedness someplace else, they came upon him to tear him limb from limb. And those two heavenly visitors who were inside listening reached out and pulled Lot through the door, and they shut the door. You remember last week we were talking about God who shut the door? Well, he shut the door in Sodom, too. And let me tell you, there wasn't anybody outside that door got saved. He shut the door. Now, in the New Testament, in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus Christ is the door. He said, I am the door. And it's highly significant in a spiritual way to read this account, keeping in mind that Jesus is the door. For the spirit of the age was this, let us destroy the door. Let us tear the door down. It was the door they were trying to find to do violence to. They wanted to break it, the Hebrew says. And that word means to destroy it, to quench it, to hurt it. Now read that carefully. Holy Spirit makes no mistakes when he writes the Bible. Suddenly they have lost interest in Lot, and now they are after the door. They want to break the door. They want to destroy it. They want to quench it. They want to crush it. They want to hurt this door. Why? Because this door is what saved Lot. Lot's behind this door. It is this door that stands between him and Sodom. It's this door that is delivered him. It's this door that has made him saved. And now their hatred and their venom 
is centered on the door. No longer is it locked, but it's the door. For if they can destroy the door, they can destroy Lot. You get the point? It isn't the Christian that the world hates. It's the door behind which he is safely communing and fellowshipping with the Lord. I mean, I don't like to think it's the Christian that the world hates. I told you before, before I was saved, I didn't have any enemies. <laughs> At least I didn't know of any. I had lots of friends, but I didn't have any open enemies. Nobody was trying to track me down to kill me. Nobody was tormenting me day and night and vexing my soul daily. Nobody watched my personal affairs and would have verily torn the door from the hinges of my home to disrupt my private fellowship. No one considered me an intruder in the community, nor did they call me holier than thou or say that I had set myself up as a judge. No mobs of the city came to my door to molest me and seek my life. And I'm not convinced that it's me that the world hates as much as it is the one who lives in me and the one who lives out of me and the one whose servant I am and whose word I preach. I'll tell you what brought the wrath of Sodom on that door. <laughs> Lot's little sermon about their wickedness. And when he spoke out against their sin and revealed that the righteousness of God lived in him. They hated that righteousness of God. And when he took refuge behind the door, they would literally have destroyed that door had God himself not intervened. And I think it's interesting to see that they never laid their hand on the door. Not one filthy sodomite hand touched that door. For well, the world can't touch that door. That door is Christ. Amen. And it can't be touched. And the reason they couldn't touch it was because they couldn't see it. And the reason they couldn't see it is because they couldn't find it. And the reason they couldn't find it was because they couldn't see it. And the reason they couldn't see it was because they couldn't find it. And the reason they couldn't see it and they couldn't find it was because they were blind. Isn't that a strange thing? And the reason they were blind was because God himself visited them first in a spiritual judgment that took from them the sight that they had had moments before. Listen. This word for blindness in the Hebrew is a strange word indeed. It's only used twice in the Old Testament. It's a special, peculiar kind of blindness, only witnessed twice in the entire Old Testament, although blindness is mentioned scores of times. This is a partial blindness. It's a blindness that does not blind men to all things, but blinds them to one particular thing, the thing which they seek above all else. The other incident was when the Syrians were coming against God's people, and they were smitten with blindness through the prophet Elisha, remember? They were trying to get to the place of war. They could see other things. They could see enough to follow Elisha, but they couldn't see the place they were looking for for they sought to destroy the things of God just as these wicked men did here. This blindness on the Syrians was brought on by God. This blindness here was brought on by divine intervention in this affair in Sodom. And these men were instantaneously stricken with a blindness that made it impossible for them to find, it says, the door. They could find anything else, but they couldn't find the door. They could find the building, but they couldn't find the door. 
They could find the street, but they couldn't find the door. They knew where Sodom was, but they couldn't find the door. And the more you think about this, the more intriguing it gets. Because this is the first judgment that God brought upon Sodom. Remember, these people that gathered at Lot's door represented the entire city. They came from every quarter, the Bible says. They were men and young boys present, and the people as well. It was the populace of the city of Sodom that was stricken with judgment before the fire and brimstone ever fell, and the judgment that came before the physical violence occurred was a spiritual judgment that resulted in a blindness that made it impossible for him to find the door. That judgment has already fallen in our time. Do you believe that? That judgment has already fallen. We are in the midst of the biggest religious boom in the history of the world. The sodomites of today are trying to find the door. Desperately trying to find it. They can see everything else, but they can't see the door. They can see the church building. They can see the denominational program. They can see the clergy with their smoothly intoned sermons that are Christless and bloodless. They can see the pomp and the ceremony and the formalism. They can see the dead dogmas and the empty creeds. They can see the phony miracles that are being performed in the name of Jesus. They can see the many cults, the many isms. Ah, oh, the world can see many things. But this generation is blind to the door. They can't see the door. Christ is the door. The Bible is full of the message that Christ is the door. He's the only door. And today we have a multitude of doors. Men are opening every conceivable door, but they're not finding the true door. This blindness only comes upon those who, rejecting all divine testimony through his witnesses, seek to destroy that door. There comes a time when a man won't believe, and then there comes a time when he can't believe. Did you know that? These men of Sodom reached a time when they couldn't believe. Once they wouldn't, find the door, and now they can't find it. Smitten with blindness, what a horrible sight, groping around. You know, I was reading up on this and trying to get to the bottom of it, and I found a pretty good dissertation by some Hebrew scholars who went into this thing very deeply. And they said they were convinced that this special blindness which came upon these inhabitants of Sodom was just as I described it, a partial blindness that made them blind only to the door. For it says that they were smitten with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. The door was the only thing they couldn't find. And these scholars said they believed with all their heart that this blindness was of such a nature that they looked at the wall and it appeared to be a door. And when they reached out to open it, lo and behold, it was a wall. And when they looked at the wall, in reality it was the door. And they were so mixed up in their vision, and the image that appeared in their eyes was so confused, that try as they could, they completely wore themselves out trying to find the true door to salvation. Lot was behind the only door of salvation in Sodom. Did you know that? It was the only place where God was in all of Sodom. I'm not talking about the building now particularly. I'm telling you that he was in the only place of safety in Sodom. He was behind the door. He was the only place where a man could be saved. He was behind the door. And this door could not be found because of judicial blindness that had come 
upon the inhabitants of Sodom. And dear friend, I could tell you many, many, many stories of people I have met in the religious world who relate their experiences to me. And it is one long experience of confusion. They tell me that they went to the altar at such an age, and then they joined the church, and then they were baptized, and then they went from one church to another, and from one experience to another, and from one step to another, and from one level of spirituality to another, and they seem to ever be learning, but never arriving at the knowledge of the truth. You know what I mean? Always groping, but never finding the door. Never sure. Never in the soul are they satisfied that they have found the door. They're safely behind it. They're always pressing on. Always reaching out. Always hoping to make it through and gain a home in heaven with you all. Always hoping to hold out faithful to the end. Always trusting to be saved. Always wondering if they've done enough works. Provided enough personal righteousness to gain heaven. They've wearied themselves looking for the door. And still they have not found it. Do you know what's wrong, dear friend? Do you think God mocks an earnest soul? No, no. But he oftentimes blinds those who are willfully ignorant to the door which is Christ. I've seen it happen in the assembly over the last 12 years. I've seen it happen wherever I've preached. I've seen it happen that men will not believe and they come to a time when they cannot believe. They're doomed and damned. And many of them spend the rest of their lives looking for the door, only to die weary and lost. Isn't that a sad, sad picture? I see the clouds gathering over Sodom. Suddenly the sky is getting black. Lot's gone. His daughters are gone. Heaven's representatives are gone. The sky is growing darker and darker. The thunder begins to peal. Judgment begins to break. What a sad picture. The population of Sodom is groping, groping, groping for the door. And they can't find it. They can't find it. You see, their motives weren't right. <laughs> they didn't want the door to the glory of God. They wanted the door to the gratification of their own flesh the satisfaction of their own lust, the enjoyment of their own desire. God won't let you have the door that way. man said to me one time, well, I'll quit my sin and I'll let God save me, he said in those very gracious words. If God will do thus and so for me, it so happened he was a man with a broken family, he said, if God will give me back my wife and children, then I'll let him save me. I said, friend, you know what you're going to do? You're going to die and go to hell. Men aren't saved on those terms. You can't want that door for the satisfaction of your own desires. You must want that door for the glory of God. Those who want that door for the glory of God will find it. Lot wanted it for the glory of God. He was willing, judge this matter as you will, brethren, he was willing to sacrifice his own daughters to preserve the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ in his home. How much have you sacrificed? How much are you willing to sacrifice? That's the reason that door couldn't be touched. And that's the reason why Lot was as safe as though he were a million miles from Sodom. And why he was delivered without even the smell of brimstone upon his garment. And why he is referred to by the Spirit of God as righteous Lot in the New Testament getting over the next week's message now. All right. I believe that judgment has already fallen. But there was a judgment yet to come. And there is a judgment yet to come to our civilization. There will be a violent throw of everything, overthrow of everything we know as life. There wasn't Sodom, there will be here. 
There are several things about this judgment that I want to give you in closing this message. First of all, I am concerned because of its suddenness without any warning. In Luke 17, when the judgment finally fell, Jesus said, said it destroyed them all. Two were in a bed, one taken, the other left. This was the parallel that he gave. Two in the field, one taken and another left. On a housetop, not even time to get the stuff. Gone. A judgment came so fast that the entire civilization perished. Then the severity of that judgment, too, lays heavy upon my heart tonight. It was a judgment void of all mercy once Lot and his daughters were safely out of the city. It was an unmixed cup of wrath. It was a horrible, horrible catastrophe that struck without warning and destroyed every living thing. Remember as we described the Holocaust of the flood? Well, you haven't heard anything yet until you hear what's happened at Sodom. First of all, if you will note in verse 25, I believe it is, that God overthrew those cities and all the plains and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. Now read that literally and believe it. That when this judgment fell, described as fire and brimstone, rained out of heaven, all the cities of the plain, which as far as I can find were five, were destroyed. All the inhabitants of the cities were destroyed. And everything that grew on the ground was destroyed. Every blade of grass, every flower, every tree, every plant and every stalk, every living thing that had root in the soil of the plains of Jordan was completely destroyed. And back in 2 Peter 2, verses 6 to 9, Peter uses two words that describe further the awful havoc of this destruction. One was that God turned these cities to ashes, completely turned them to ashes. And the second word which he uses to describe this destruction was overthrow. And the word overthrow in the Greek is our English word catastrophe. And it means a complete reversal. It means that where there was once water, there was land, and where there was once land, there was water. It means that everything was completely reversed. Everything was destroyed that was alive, that grew with its roots in the earth. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, and every vestige of their cities were completely reduced to nothing but ashes. And in the 28th verse, Abraham went out on the mountaintop to look over the plains of Jordan the next morning. And it was all over. And the smoke that billowed up from what was left of the five cities was so great that it looked like the smoke of a giant furnace. And Abraham, if you'll study this out on your map, was miles and miles and miles away. Well, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, we don't need any rational explanations of how it come to pass, but there is a rational explanation. The spiritual explanation is simple, and the Word of God gives it. It was God who overthrew the cities. It was God who, by personal intervention, did something that caused this destruction. And I think he uses natural means many times, and the natural means were available in the plains of Sodom. Geologists have excavated, done their preliminary investigations there. Divers have gone to the 1,300-foot bottom of the Dead Sea, and they've discovered many things about the formation of the ground in that vicinity. Here is what they found. Deep beneath those plains, there was a strata of solid salt, 150 foot thick. On top of that salt was another strata of solid sulfur. 
there was a vast underground oil supply which had built up a terrific amount of gas. And on top of all the gas and oil and sulfur and salt, there was found one of the greatest deposits of asphalt or bitumen pitch in the world. Some mysterious hand ignited the gaseous pressure on that vast oil supply, and in an explosion which undoubtedly was heard round the world, that salt and that sulfur and that vast deposit of asphalt was blown sky high all over the Jordan Valley, and when it came down, it came down in flaming fire and brimstone. The deposit of the ground is of such a nature that when it's properly dried out, it will burn like a poor grade of coal. And the valley was set afire by the flaming pitch that rained out of heaven, and nothing was left but ashes. And from that day to this, there has been no living thing in that area. The crater that was left by this awful holocaust was filled in with the waters of the Jordan, and we call it today the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the deadest body of water on the face of the earth. That's the reason it got its name. The salt deposit in the waters of the Dead Sea are so great that the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, the ratio is six pounds of salt to a hundred pounds of water, but in the Dead Sea it's thirty pounds of salt for every hundred pounds of water. There is not a living creature in all the Dead Sea. There is not even a specimen of marine life as far as plants are concerned in the Dead Sea. The only thing seen in the Dead Sea is an occasional dead fish that was washed into the sea from the waters of the Jordan, which are fresh. The whole vast area once occupied by the proud cities of the plains became a burning crater, and when reduced to ashes was soon filled over the years with the waters of the Jordan River and become now a monument to the certainty, the severity, and the swiftness of the judgment of God. And when you study Sodom and Gomorrah's overthrow, and go through the New Testament again with this in mind, you will find reference after reference by the writers and by the Lord Jesus himself to the overthrow of Sodom. Because on a high hill in Jerusalem, you could see what was left of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it stood forever nearby Jerusalem as a reminder that when God visits in judgment, his judgments are without mercy. Do you know that the destruction that took place at Sodom and Gomorrah were so awful that they are referred to in the Bible as an example or an illustration of what hell is like? For when Jesus wanted to describe what hell was like, he said it had a fire that was never quenched, that burned with fire and brimstone and he was referring to the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in 2 Peter 2, 9, the Holy Spirit says that God overthrew those cities in order to make them an example to those who would afterward live ungodly. Now you hear what I'm saying, because God did something in Sodom and Gomorrah on a small scale that one day he will do worldwide. Peter writes of it in his epistle of a day when the elements began to melt with fervent heat, when the heavens and the earth and all that are in them disappeared in a tremendous breakup of the universe itself, when it was turned into a mass of fire and vanished and there was found no place for them, and God brought in a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And the question is tonight, are you righteous? You say, well, of course I'm not righteous. Good. 
then you're a candidate for righteousness. For only the unrighteous are called to repentance. And if you're unrighteous tonight and know that you're unrighteous, God has a righteousness for you. This righteousness is Christ. He will freely give him to you. There is a door in this Sodom behind which you may flee for safety. There is a place where all Sodom combined cannot touch you and where the overthrow of this civilization will not come nigh you, though 10,000 fall at your right hand. That place is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad tonight as I've been studying Sodom and Gomorrah. It's kind of shook me up. And I'm so glad that I'm in Christ. I'm so glad I'm behind that door. We read about God's judgments and somehow or another we find a way to rationalize them in our minds. But oh, as it was in Noah's time, sudden and swift and total destruction, so it was in Sodom. And so Jesus says, shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. How near is it? It's so near that the spiritual blindness that afflicted the Sodomite has already overtaken this people. So near that we are in the night scenes in Genesis 19, and the inhabitants of our time are searching for the door with no success. We are living in the days when God's people are going to be meeting secretly behind that closed door to have those last few hours of fellowship before the overthrow of our times. Call me anything you like. I believe these things. And because I believe them, they've changed my life. And they've changed my view of the civilization I live in. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this message from thy word. And we pray for those who are in our audience tonight unsaved. Whoever they are, thou knowest. Some like the Sodomites, living in their sin and unconcerned. Some like Lot's wife, swept along with the testimony of someone in the family, only to learn at the day of judgment that they were only professing Christians and never possessing the righteousness which is by faith. For those who are unsaved, Father, in this meeting tonight, we pray that they may turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that they will not turn to him in saving faith unless they are thoroughly persuaded of the Holy Spirit in their hearts of their own total corruption, depravity, and need. Oh, Father, we pray that there's someone here tonight who may see that they're sinners and know that Jesus is the Savior of sinners and hide behind that door of safety. We ask in his precious name. Amen. Lord bless you.